everyone. My name is Elizabeth Gessel and I am the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora. Um, and first of all, I want to welcome you all um, today to jo for joining us and really hope that all of you are safe and healthy, um, first and foremost. This is such a difficult time and um, we're all worried about each other and also grateful to be able to have this space to come together um, and connect with each other. So I really appreciate and um, just want to thank you all for taking the time to come and join together like this today. Um, regardless of what happens, we made it. Um, so uh, of course, I, I wish we could be in the lobby um, at MOAD right now, but uh, I also recognize that doing it in this way, we've opened it up to new and um, further regions. And so I'm hoping that some people are joining us from outside the Bay Area. I heard somebody say they were joining from New York at the very beginning, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and I do have to just take a moment to say that um, if you would like to, wow, Australia, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. Um, Paris, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, I have to stop reading and just keep talking. Um, I know this is a really hard time for everyone, and it is also a hard time for art institutions um, around the, the globe right now. And so if you have any inclination to support MOAD and um, can give any amount to the museum right now to help. Um, these programs to continue to run, we'd really appreciate. And you can do that very easily by texting um, MOAD SF to the number 56512, and I'll put that in the chat so um, you can see it. But I just want to get that out of the way. Um, I also want to announce that uh, because of accessibility issues, we are going to change the book for next month's selection. Um, the book that we had chosen, Small Country, was not available in very many um, platforms, and we didn't want to have people have a hard time getting it. It was very expensive in hardback. Um, so we will return to that selection in a future month, but next month um, we're going to be reading Lagoon by Nnedi Okorafor, and um, information about that will be on the website at moadsf.org. Um, and we'll remind you at the end as well. Um, so that, that's all the logistics and uh, details I wanna talk about now. Uh, now I just wanna turn it over to our wonderful leader, Faith Adiele, who founded the African Book Club and has been running it um, in conjunction with MOAD for the past few months. And um, we're so excited to have her leadership today to help us through this new forum. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Mia. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm so happy you could join. And I'm, you know, we're making lemon out of lemonade. So I love the fact that we had to go online um, and that brings in new people and that we can have this international, truly international conversation. And I was um, tweeting about it how we were going to do this, um, you know, rather than, um, rather than cancel, that we were going to go online. And so then the author, was like, oh, hey, do you want me to stop by? So she's gonna join us in about 20 minutes, um, provided everything goes well. Uh, so it's been great, because she and I have been like emailing every day, and that's another one of the, you know, kind of unexpected joys that came at, at, out of this, um, that we have had people visit in the past sometimes, but never, we would never be able to connect with someone from Australia, so I'm super excited. So oh, I'm trying to let people in at the same time, so I'm a little distracted here. Um, so we have about 20 minutes before she joins us, but um, I would just like to do just a really brief uh, introduction. So people can just check in, just tell us your name, where you're um, Zooming in from, and maybe just like one kind of lemonade for you, like one, one thing you've been able to do, one new thing that you've taken up, or some kind of joy that you've been able to create out of this situation that we're in. Um, and I guess I'm gonna do it like Hollywood Squares, whoever I can see. I'll just call you and hopefully you can unmute and respond. Um, okay, Nia. 
My name is Nia, and I'm calling in here from Oakland. Um, I also work at the Museum of the African Diaspora. Um, and one of the joys of this uncertain time is the amount of cooking that I've been able to do in the last couple of weeks. Excellent, yeah. Liz Murray. Well, so actually I'm working on my dissertation. Um, and anyway, but that with coronavirus, I'm back in Australia. I'm doing my studies in San Francisco, but I've been spending time with my mom here, which has been really great. Wonderful. Great. Oh, okay. And I see, oh, great. And this will help if some people are typing it in because we probably won't get to everybody. So I appreciate that some people are chatting in. Great. Christina Mitchell. Hi, um, I'm in Oakland right now, and I have actually started a pretty intense workout routine, so I'm kind of proud of myself. Wow, I'm proud of you too. <laughs> that is not me. <laughs> Yeva. Hi, my name is Yeva. I am in San Francisco, and um, I have uh, gained a great appreciation, I think, for saving things because I really am trying to stay in. And so I used to cut up all the tips. I used to be like a throwaway, those tips of broccoli, especially fruits and vegetables. So I have learned something that I think ties me back to uh, the days of the depression or something. I get a more understanding why Things aren't quite as bad as they look <laughs> until, you, until you can't get access to them. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Jacqueline Johnson. You need to get Hi, I'm uh, talking to you from Brooklyn. Yay. Um, yay, Brooklyn in the house. Um, I would say that for me, I've been working on some uh, fi fabric masks. Uh, to send to one of the organizations that uh, contacted my quilt guild, working on some short stories, and at the bottom of the list is cleaning my apartment. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Great thing. Brittany Pruitt. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm calling in. I'm in Australia, but I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I've been grateful for all the time I've had to connect with people virtually, like friends and just in general moments like this. So, yeah. Wonderful. Welcome. Alejandra Rincon. No. Uh, Allison Gates. Let's see. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me get the video up. Okay. There we go. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I'm um, Allison, and I live in San Francisco, and I've been spending this time, I've, I've been staying with my mom, um, telecommuting, doing more cooking, and doing, um, trying to get an uh, a exercise routine going also. And I just wanted to say that this has been great because um, even though I live in San Francisco, I probably would not have made it down to Moad, so this has given me the opportunity to participate. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great. Alejandro, are you back? <laughs> I saw you briefly. Yes, uh, I am. Thank you. Um, just, um, again, happy to see all of this beautiful places. Um, I went on a long workout and I am um, in the outer Richmond, so I went all the way up to the bridge and crossed the bridge and made it back home. And I'm super sorry, but happy to see all of you on the line. <laughs> Yay, thanks for coming back in time. <laughs> Alexa, hey Alexa, how are you? Hey, doing good. <laughs> so you can probably guess where I'm living. Uh, I'm actually out in the East Bay and uh, I actually had knee surgery last fall, so I spent five months at home already. So I was all ready to finally get out of the house. I was like, nope. <laughs> so I'm finishing a lot, of, lot more cooking. Really love connecting with a whole bunch of people all around the world using Zoom and other things. And I'm just finishing um, PT virtually. <laughs> so very interesting way to finish it up. Right? Uh, interesting. 
And I probably couldn't have made it to Moad either. So this is really terrific that you're doing it online. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good to see everyone. I'm on my phone, so I'll probably go off video here for a little while and go roam and do things. But okay, great. Good to meet everyone. Thank you. Sean Reese. Hey, I'm calling in from Oakland, California. And um, I think having an opportunity to hang out with people virtually that I would maybe occasionally speak with on the phone or text with occasionally or see in person when I was uh, visiting family down south has been really great. I was involved with somebody long distance in Chicago and we would do date nights remotely and watch movies together and, you know, talk at the TV to go in the basement. And, uh, you know, I've done that with one of my closest friends from high school for many years now. And, you know, now, now I'm doing it with everybody and kind of reconnecting with people who were close to my heart, but that I maybe hadn't spoken with for a couple of years. So I feel in some ways kind of strangely closer to people. Right. So it's, right. it's been great making that time with folks. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Elsie. Hey, um, I'm Elsie from Bailey City, California. And I'm excited to get to this meeting because I've been watching these meetings happen for like over maybe two years trying to get to one. Um, but one of the, one of the blessings of um, that's been happening is because I've been slowing down. Um, I'm eating healthier, mm. just like taking my time cooking instead of the fast stuff. And um, and I've been appreciating the cleaner air. Yeah. Um, right. So, yeah. Thanks. Good, thank you. Welcome. Um, Yelka? One second, let me unmute myself. Hi, everyone. I'm calling from New York, Queens, New York. Um, and I'm actually really excited to participate in this. I saw this on Sissoko's um, Instagram. And so that's how I heard of the museum and that you guys actually have this book club. So I'm grateful that I could participate and I've just been cooking a lot finding peace and comfort in the kitchen and trying out new recipes and reading so and just trying to learn how to relax and enjoy <laughs> relaxing you know being in New York you're just so used to go 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 mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people are not comfortable with relaxing or not having things to do so right I'm meant to learn that great welcome <laughs> Yeah. You're muted still. Calling in from San Francisco. Um, I'm a member at MOAD and I just actually want to start by um, thanking Elizabeth for her unstinting devotion to MOAD. So I think someone needs to say that to her from time to time and just we really, really, really appreciate everything that she does. And um, I think for me, I'm just really happy to have the opportunity to connect with Zoom, which most of my classes and all have been on Zoom now. And I'm just happy the technology is here for all of us. Great. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Shauna Sherman. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having this online. I would normally normally be at work. So, so glad that, I mean, that's that's a blessing. Um, I'm calling from Alameda and getting a ton of reading done. Mm, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Brooke Meyer. Hello, I'm calling from San Francisco and I've really been enjoying positioning my seating arrangement in my house to have as many windows available <laughs> as possible. <laughs> um, I successfully did that. Like right now I can see Mount Tam and then some of the ocean. And so on top of that, I've really been enjoying hearing the birds. Oh, right, isn't that nice? Yeah, yeah. wonderful, great. Um, there's somebody whose first initial is M, last name Anderson. Hi, I'm Michelle and I'm in San Francisco. Ah, oh, boy, I've been Zoomed out for centuries. Um, what do I appreciate about this time? Well, I uh, do like to cook and I like to try recipes, but what that has resulted in is I have a bunch of stuff in my freezer and some of it has been there since the ice age. So I've been defrosting all this stuff that I've made the last six months and most of it tastes pretty good. So, <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yes. Wonderful. I, <laughs> mm. Great. And drink, drinking lots of tea since I have this rule that I don't drink booze by myself. And since my entire social life bit the dust, <laughs> mm. tea is great. I oh. want to get invited to one of these virtual happy hours that apparently Man. I'm having and I have not been invited to. So I'm like, <laughs> what's with that? <laughs> uh, Vanetta. Good evening. Um, my name is Vinetta. You can call me V or Miss V. I'm calling from the American Midwest. And one of the things that I've been um, able to do is to follow in the spirit of Audrey Lord and actually practice self-care. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been, it's been um, transforming and it's been difficult because I've, I've felt real guilty about uh, so practicing self-care, but I'm I'm getting better at it each day. So glad that this is available online. I've actually never been to the San Francisco area. Uh, one of my former students does live in that area. So um, hopefully I will get to visit uh, in person one day. But thank you for having this online and for being so welcome. Oh, it's a pleasure. You're welcome. Wanda. You're not, you're not coming, I'm not hearing you. You're not muted, but I, I'm not hearing you. I'm still not, is anyone hearing Wanda? No, we can't hear you. Hmm. And you are unmuted, so um, I don't know. Maybe try mute and unmute again, and then maybe um, hit us up in the chat. Still not hearing you, sorry. Okay, um, I will move on, sorry about that. Um, Yolanda. Is Yolanda here? Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm here. Okay. I'm Yolanda. Um, I should know how to get to unmute faster because I've been Zooming for the past three weeks. Um, however, I'm from Alameda, originally from Oakland, and I'm really thrilled that this is happening because I have had the opportunity to have non-work-related Zoom meetings that have been really positive and um, enlightening and has been helping to decrease the stress and anxiety of the unknown. So just being able to be with positive people and talk about positive things is really helpful for me as part of my self-care. Wonderful, great, thank you. Uh, Anna Marie. Anna Marie Booth. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm joining from San Francisco. I have not read the book, uh, but I'm interested in an adult book club that focuses on um, books of interest. So I thought I would just check in. Yes. Great. Welcome. That you bring up a good point. Yes, you don't have to have read the book to participate in book club. Um, we will discuss the ends normally. So. Um, Nobody has to worry, you know, we don't worry about spoiler alerts. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully it'll get you excited about buying the book or looking at the other books we've read. At this point, I think we've done four, 40 books in, in African Book Club in general. We've been at MOAD, I think for maybe, maybe this is our fourth book at MOAD, but there's a, mm -hmm. a, a long <laughs> library of, of really exciting text that we've dealt with that we've covered and we've tried to read widely around the continent um so yeah i forgot to mention that this time <laughs> we've been doing this good, for good to know yeah we've been doing it for about five years now only reading things that have been published in the 21st century so in the 2000s to, to now um and uh yeah we're trying to you know read broadly um and uh i think yeah i think I think that's about it. Uh, and also read from kind of unrepresented areas from that first 
you know, the first generation of African writers, which was very kind of natural, nationalistic and male. We try to read a lot of women, a lot of queer texts, a lot of um, things that are kind of more experimental, but as well as things that are getting a lot of attention, dealing with important issues right now, but really either um, set in Africa by Africans with Africa content, even though lots of them have, uh, you know, maybe a kind of an immigrant thread to them as well. Um, and we have an ongoing uh, Google document where participants can contribute, can suggest titles that we go to as well. So um, to be kind of part of this as we, uh, as we work it through. So, woo! okay, hopefully she's gonna be coming soon. So let's see how many more people can I get through in time. Uh, Carla's iPad, <laughs> who's that? <laughs> That's me, Carla, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Carla Stocker from Atlanta, Georgia, and actually used to travel to San Francisco what? once a month for work. So have been able to do a lot of events or participate in a lot of events at MOED. Um, so again, happy to be here. Um, it's you know, dark here. <laughs> Eastern time zone, um, read the book, loved it, and thank you for doing this. Wonderful. My pleasure. Okay. Um, uh, Inja? Inja? I'm sorry for destroying that name. Futero? Okay. Apparently, I butchered that name so much that the person doesn't know that I'm calling on them. <laughs> um, there are a couple of just phone numbers. Um, last one ends in 4015. Does that person want to check in? Hello? Hi. You couldn't hear me when I was actually on the phone and okay. in the video. So I guess that's oh. why you couldn't hear me. Okay, is this Wanda? This is Wanda. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, Wanda. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm um, I'm in Alameda and I hear so some other folks in Alameda, so that's kind of nice. And, uh, and I begin teaching at the College of Alameda all online beginning Tuesday. So that's going to be really exciting. We're going to be using Zoom. So I'm trying to like Develop my skill set, and uh, I've been having a lot of fun catching up on my reading and going for walks and bike rides to the beach. Oh. So, um, yeah. Wonderful. Great. Welcome. There's another telephone, and the last four digits are 1718. Hello? There's um, one just called iPhone. Okay. Is there anybody I haven't called on who would like to check in? Okay, so <laughs> we look like we're at 28. Um, we uh, generally the only rule we have in um, Afri African Book Club is to make sure that two or three other people speak. Once you've spoken, that two or three other people speak before you speak again, so that we create space for everybody and so that it also doesn't end up being a back and forth. Um, it'll be a little interesting because we'll have the author here too. And so, um, <coughs> I assume that she'll be doing most of the facilitating that you can, you know, address questions directly to her. Um, if it gets a little crazy, then maybe we'll go to like a, a chat function and let her respond that way or a hand raising function. Um, so we'll just kind of see how it goes, I suppose. Um, and um, for those people who haven't read it, I guess uh, just a kind of a quick summary of it. I don't know, Elizabeth, Nia, do you want to summarize? Are either of you interested? 
doing all the talking. What it's about. I think you should do it, Nia, because I did it last time. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, so I guess in summary, it's a nonfiction um, narrative um, where the author charts her life experience um, growing up in South Africa um, with parents who essentially are uh, revolutionaries and um, navigating what kind of life in a sense of exile is. And so her and her family move around to several different countries throughout her life. Um, so parts, her, her book is kind of chronological where she charts um, time periods where she, she and her family live in Canada, where she goes to school um, in the United States, um, when ultimately her family lives um, in Mozambique towards the end, and then also um, touching upon her current life now in Australia. And so what I found, it was very, it was a very engaging um, narrative for me. And I actually found very poetic um, charting her life and I'm holding it here in, in front of me. Um, and what I appreciated it also in the story, her use of family photos to help document um, the story. And I think that also helps put a face to this very unique um, narrative of hers. Um, yeah, that was a brief summary. <laughs> there's so much more, than, there's like so many details that it's hard to figure out exactly how to touch upon all of them. Um, but I think it's, it's an interesting um, just perspective into what it looks like and how you find home in, in a position of so much movement and transition um, and the way she she comes to find home in all of these places of the, in the people who help define her life and ultimately in herself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I love the subtitle, uh, um, A Memoir of Exile and Home, and those two terms feel like they're constantly being defined and redefined and forced exile versus self-imposed exile. Um, and then what her time in the U.S. Um, in at university is really kind of helps her formulate her political analysis and her awareness of race in a in a way that being in exile, which differs from how she's been in, in exile. Um, I was just listening to her TED talk again this afternoon, which is what's it called? If a story moves you, act on it. Um, and you know, she's someone who comes out of years of being an activist. Um, and a an, uh, very vocal African feminist, a critique of uh, South Africa today, um, and then um, actually ran a nonprofit that did stories. And so I really loved what she, because you could tell the importance of story in this memoir too. It's like, even as she's living an event, she's thinking about how she's then gonna turn it into a story, what the narrative will be. And she does this great job of kind of connecting personal stories to the story of the nation state and to you know the stories that liberate us. but. In her TED Talk, she's also very uh, critical of stories and cautioning about how nowadays we have very little analysis and we have very little actually hard research news and we just kind of go with story and what moves us. And she's saying that we need both. We need political analysis with story. We need a free press with story. We can't just, that sometimes we can think that if we empathize with the story, that's the same as being active. Um, and you know, one of the things in her in her coming of age that she talks about is being the daughter of a revolutionary and being raised with political awareness is not the same as being politically active. So I just kind of appreciate the activist element that she brings uh, to the to the creative story and and how I think telling the story is is a form of political engagement for her. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of interesting things to talk about. And of course, gender and patriarchy, in addition to racism and colonialism and class, so much of the class, there are like all these really, really big issues um, that, uh, that the book deals with. Um, so, don't know. I mean, <laughs> what are some things, what are some elements that people really wanna make sure that uh, we talk about. Mm. 
regardless of what you get to ask her, what do you want to discuss as a group? Because that often changes the dynamic too. You can feel free to unmute yourself and tell me or write it in the in the chat here. Yeah, so for, um, this is Yelka calling from New York. Um, so I read this book two years ago when I was in South Africa doing an internship, a graduate internship for working with a nonprofit. And whenever I travel, I usually always like to read books by authors from that country, right? Absolutely. And then I went to a bookstore and I was like, okay, I want to get a book by, uh, by an African, a South African um, woman. You know, usually I try to just get diverse writers. Um, that I wouldn't necessarily have access to in the States. Um, and I was really curious in understanding like the state of South Africa now, right? Like the vision of what the revolutionaries had, right? For the country versus what it is now. So it's two of the books that I got, well, I had hoped like would give me insight to that. So I'm interested in hearing from the author, like what, you know, I talked about it a little bit and to, to talk, she talks about it quite a lot in the book but I would love to hear more of her thoughts about that like what the vision of, um, for the revolutionaries were versus what it is now mm -hmm. and how that also can um, I think the connection with that in the U.S. even you know the civil rights movement versus the state that we are currently are in with Black Lives Matter and whatnot. Wonderful. Okay. Great. Holly. One of the things that I found to be really interesting about this book and that I didn't know about was um, like a, a, a discussion of intra-African relationships and um, I, I really I found that really eye-opening her talk about immigrants to South Africa from other African countries and you know and the differences between the African countries she lived in as well, um, Zambia versus um, Kenya. It's just it was very interesting to think about that. And um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about I, I found that very interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but I found this whole book interesting. And I'm glad Nia mentioned the poetry of it, because sometimes the language, it, it's like so, it was such a pleasure. Like, the perfect word would be placed and then she always has these surprises as she's going along but just the beauty of the words the line breaks even like the poetry is embedded in in the greater text and so um i really enjoyed that too mm, wonderful wonderful i was actually in south africa during the time she's talking about where there's the kind of the the riots that she's talking about in 2008, the ethnocentric riots. Um, and, you know, there's been a kind of a long standing anger towards Zimbabweans and Nigerians, which you may have, like, if you've seen the film District 9, all they do is talk trash about Nigerians. Um, and so that was, it was interesting to see that moment captured there as well, uh, as, you know, yeah, all of the kind of stuff that then happens after. Um, and she contextualizes it well too that like none of that violence is ever turned against the white south africans but you know then against other africans kind of the fantasy that uh, you know the other groups are holding them down or that there's a limited amount of, of resources um so not you know and they're not always negative relationships in terms of these inter-african but they you know they are complicated um so thanks for bringing that up I see that Holly is here. Holly is my co-founder of the Original African Book Club. Hey, Faith. How are you? Hey, everybody. Hi. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm joining late. I'm just, you know, have the mood to clean, and then I realize, ah, I'm late. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, so I'm just here listening, but, yeah, it's exciting to see so many people. I know, right? Yeah. yeah it's really cool. Great. And we have folks from Australia, Brussels. Wow. Canada, so that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, really? Pretty exciting. Um, 
Hey, so I just wanted to mention a point. This is Brittany. Um, I was really excited about this because when I first moved to Australia, I actually saw Sasanke as um, a panelist on one of the popular news stations. And I was like, wow, like, who is this black woman? She's so awesome. And just really speaking about issues that I care about. Was, um, uh, about, I think it had something to do with like African, um, a recent discovery about African DNA. Um, but either way, that's what led me to finding her book um, and reading it. And so I'm a little over halfway through and I haven't gotten to the part where she talks about her experience in Australia, but I would love to kind of highlight that experience as a black woman um, in a very white country <laughs> and you know how she's navigated that experience over the last few years that she's been here. I'm not actually exactly sure how long she's been here, but um, yeah, it's definitely something I'd love to spend a little bit of time on. Great. Um, and I think that you're going to just have to ask her about it because it's not really in the book. Oh, okay. So that's one of the joys of then having the author here um, is that you can find out then what happens later because it's more about it's the, po the moment where they leave, where they actually decide to leave South Africa. And, um, and part of that is about, and starting to write is part of that. Like, mm. how can I, you know, if, if your entire life you've grown up outside of this country in exile, waiting for it to be free so you can go there, <laughs> you know, this yeah. makes so hot, you go there. And of course it can't live up to that. <laughs> you know, no, nothing could live up to that regardless because it's, you know, it's mythic and it's, you know, metaphorical. Mm -hmm. um, so the, it was very hard for her to decide to leave. And so she talks about writing as a process of allowing her to imagine leaving, but still being engaged. How would you do that? Um, and so the book kind of ends in that moment of redefining, do you have to be geographically in your home to have returned home? Mm, okay. Really interesting. Um, and then she puts that in the larger context of, you know, African movement, because uh, we're always going someplace. That's just the mm -hmm. nature of African life, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, but... Um, I don't, I mean, yeah, I don't think there's actually any her talking about what it's like in Australia, but I, I'd be interested to hear how, how she deals with that as well. How long have you been there? Um, it'll be eight months. Oh, yeah, eight months now. Yeah. Okay, really? <laughs> um, and I have, I don't know how much longer because it's kind of um, TBD, but um, I was here for a part of my master's, so I'll go back to the U.S. to finish the second year um, next semester. Great. Very good. Anyone else? Anything so there? she's so, so she's been there through fires and now pandemic. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a master's. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah, it's been quite a, a warm welcome to Australian life. <laughs> You can go anywhere from there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You can never predict what country is going to like do something like that. You know, like I'm going to go here and it'll be great, and then something else comes up. So we never know. So good. Um, one thing that I really enjoyed about the book. There's so many things, but some that's coming up to me right now is um, how she describes the transition. Um, around how she views her parents um, and how that changes when you're a child to when you're an adult. And, and I think it in some ways sort of mirrors her relationship to South Africa, how that changes when she's a, right. outside and then inside. Um, I think she's making that parallel. Um, but I just, I thought, you know, as a, a woman with a mother and with children, I thought it made me think a lot about um, those relationships and how they shift over time. And I really appreciated that. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that is. And of course that informs, you know, the love relationship mm -hmm. she's, she in, gets into. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, that, um, I love that moment where she realizes that she's been like, not really, that she's been, she's not really seeing her mother clearly, you know, 
she's like idolized her father as the revolutionary, but not realized kind of the quiet way in which her mother is keeping it all together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and is there <laughs> all the time. <laughs> And then it's like dealing with stuff. So that was a, yeah, it was a lovely moment too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, love, love is big throughout the whole thing. I also thought by the end of the book, I was thinking about identity because she's so much identified as South African and her mother is from Swaziland at the time mm -hmm. the book was written. And, you know, I, I just, after I was like, but why, did, why, did she not see herself as a dual nationality rather than a single one? Um, and I think that's that would be interesting to know. Oh, hello. Look right there. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> oh, we're, oh, no, we're not hearing you yet. Uh -oh. No, not this. <laughs> Okay, you're muted. Now can you hear me? Yes, yay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I said 845 and then I just realized that I said 830, so I'm very sorry. No, 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 it doesn't matter. We've been, you know, touching base. Everybody checked in. People have been talking a little bit about what they want to talk about, and what they want to know. Okay. So Okay, great. We've got 30 people in the room with you, so. Um, wow, yeah. oh my goodness, We've got fantastic. We've got someone from Australia. We have someone from Brussels. Someone from Paris. Uh, oh, from the US how exciting! Coast. So in Oakland, your old stomping ground. I'm I'm calling. Yes. You <laughs> <laughs> so, That's great. Thank you so much for taking the time to. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, wonderful. So great. So is there? Um, did you want to start with doing <laughs> with doing a little show <laughs> before we launch into our questions? Sure thing. I, I never know what people want me to read. Um, so. Any requests? Um, any requests? Oh, there's so much that I love in here. But. Okay, I can, I'm happy to. Um, Did you have a plan yourself? Yep, I'm happy to read from the end. It's just that I never know if people have finished the book, so maybe I shouldn't. Some people have not. Um, Some people have not finished it. Okay. I think you should read wherever you want to read. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Um, okay, cool. Um, my earliest memories, my earliest memory of sex is bound up in pleasure and voyeurism. I was only six when I stumbled upon a man and a woman in flagrante, but I was old enough to know that she was having far too much fun. <laughs> I knew this because I could hear it in the way she chuckled, which I knew she was not supposed to do because what she was doing was something only men were allowed to like. I knew it even though I wouldn't have been able to tell you why. There was something off limits about the way men turned their heads whenever a plump bummed woman passed them, passed them by. Women were supposed to pretend they hadn't noticed and other men were supposed to look as well. I was very young when I realized men were supposed to like things to do with women's bodies and women had to guard themselves against the things that men liked. They had to not smile and pretend they didn't notice. Men were fools over sex and women were silly about love. The women around me must have talked about men's sex and pleasure, but those discussions were never fit for children's ears. So I didn't get to hear them in any detail. I heard only the talk about love and romance. I saw the looks exchanged and sensed what they were saying, what they weren't saying, but I never heard them talk about sex. The men were different. They talked about everything in front of us, white settlers and ditched lovers and fallen women they had picked up. Often they had drunk too much. They leered and laughed and didn't mind their manners unless they were told by the woman that there were children around and so they should shush. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> that was great. Okay. So, <laughs> well, what do we, um, we've been talking, a, I mean, we're just talking about how there's just so much in this book, um, you know, that we 
talk about it forever. All sorts of like really big, big issues as well as the small personal stuff. Um, and then we have just questions about things in general, about like what life is like in Australia <laughs> and, you know, all of these sorts of things. So, yeah. um, um, but one of the things that um, I really appreciated throughout was how much attention um, you, you placed uh, on context. And, you know, we're always aware of the fact that it's a personal story, but it's happening within a historicized moment and that, um, the, imp the important role of storytelling for individuals, but also in terms of the national narrative. And it also gives your narrator an incredible amount of, I think, kind of understanding and humanity. So like, you know, when you're talking about um, like the, the uh, praise God and how he abuses the young narrator, or when you're talking about um, the first incident of you know racism in um, in Canada, you're always placing things in larger context so we understand why people are are behaving in the way they are too. It's not just that they're yes. problematic yeah. individuals. And I was really um, really admired that. I was just wondering how you thought about kind of bringing in that adult reflective narrator along with the child's point of view, and so that we're reading it in, it two on two two levels. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that. It was really important to me for a couple of reasons. One, I was very aware that I was a South African writing about an experience that many South Africans did not have. So um, my first audience um, is always a South African audience. It doesn't mean I'm not interested in other parts of the audience, but the person I imagine in my mind is a South African. And so I wanted to make sure that I was giving context in really detailed and deep ways because I knew that it wasn't an experience that so many South Africans, because of the isolation of apartheid, what it meant, you know, these times we're talking about self-isolation, South Africa was, you know, literally sealed off from the rest of the world. So that was a big a part of why context mattered. The other reason, of course, is that I'm a feminist and Feminism is all about context, right? You, you have to, you, we reach our politics uh, through an understanding of where we sit in the big wide world. Um, and this was um, a book that I very much wanted to write because I had things to say about the world. And the way into saying those things about the world was through my experience. So it wasn't, you know, everyone says this about writing memoirs, but I did feel that to write a self-indulgent memoir about myself was not the purpose. The purpose was to write a larger set of reflections about the world and to use the fact that I had just been born in extraordinary times to a pretty extraordinary sort of set of circumstances as the way into that larger conversation. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful, great. And um, so given that South, South Africans are your first audience, and then I assume, you know, it widens out in concentric circles from that, can you give us any kind of insight into the, the response that you've had or interesting conversations, things you hadn't expected? Have you been able to kind of spark the conversation that you wanted or have you reached people you hadn't anticipated? So uh, within South Africa, of course, um, I think I spoke to who I wanted to speak to and, and that continues to happen and that's been uh, wonderful. Uh, I also hadn't accounted for how similar my experience had been growing up to many South Africans within South Africa. So mm. the idea that, you know, growing up in a black middle class family um, during apartheid would have been a sense of feeling of isolated and exiled from home and a similar kinds of loneliness uh, growing up. You know, there were all kinds of ways in which, in which, which people's dislocation within the country meant that they also felt as though they were in exile. So mm -hmm. that was the first thing I hadn't fully realized, which was, you know, fantastic. Yeah. The other thing, of course, was how many other people like me of, you know, of whatever variety have had similar experiences of growing up in lots of different places between cultures. I kind of knew that, but I didn't um, understand that the texture with which people had felt that was going to be so similar. Um, and so that's been really interesting and have had lots of kind of conversations of comradeship with people mm -hmm. about what it meant to always be somewhere else other than home growing up. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been, uh, 
And then of course it's been several years since, since I wrote the book and it's always funny having conversations about it like now where um, I think to myself, God, I would write it so differently now. <laughs> I hate reading. I hate reading from it because I'm like, oh God, why didn't we edit this better? But, yeah. <laughs> right, it's not always the case. <laughs> always. always. <laughs> That's so true. That's funny. I've had very, yeah, I, you know, I told you I was like really resonating with it. There were so many things and I'm, you know, coming from a kind of a Nigerian not kind of, coming from a Nigerian context, but you know, there are those similarities and then I've also had similar experiences with people, you know, where I was like so impacted by the Nigerian civil war and but I was outside and people were like inside saying, oh, I couldn't, you know, I was so shocked to find out that it impacted you. So you only know your like little portion and you imagine, That's right. like, oh, if I only had this, you know, things would have That's been right. fine. I would feel at home if only I'd been there and <laughs> the people who were there. That's right. Really, you know, feel that That's way. Right. <laughs> That's right. And And so ultimately I think, whenever you begin to explore the questions of belonging, you realize that the story itself doesn't matter. It's the kind of, you know, universal experience of what does it mean to try to belong somewhere? Um, you know, what is that question that I am seeking to answer? Um, and if it's about belonging, then of course there are multiple entry points into that and people, people will, will, will resonate with that underlying theme that you're trying to get at. Right. <laughs> okay, well, I know lots of people have questions, so I'm gonna step aside and uh, let's hear some. Should I put myself on mute? How does this work? Should I be on mute when someone is asking a question? I don't think so. I think it, it'll be fine. Oh. I've muted okay. most people, so we won't get much feedback. It looks like Brittany, did, did you, you wanna speak? Yeah, I did. I know um, this is outside of the book now from having some conversations, but I just wanted to ask because I'll have to hop off soon. So I'm currently living in Australia. I'm in Adelaide and I'm doing, <laughs> yeah. Hi. So yeah, I'm doing a part of my master's here, um, but I'm from the U.S. I'm from outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and so my question was um, based on, you know, your experience moving so much as a child and navigating, you know, different you know, white spaces, um, moving to the U.S. and Canada. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about how that's been in, in Australia, like your transition from, you know, South Africa to Australia and just what kind of things you've experienced since you've been here. Yeah. Um, so Australia, like uh, sort of all settler colonies, is a very racist place. Um, and because there, uh, because there aren't a lot of Black people uh, at all, the uh, kind of entitlement to hold racist views is still very strong. Um, so you will encounter, and I, and I don't think that racism is worse in any part of the world than in others, it just manifests itself differently. So I'm not sure that Australian racism is worse than white South African racism, for example, because those people have perfected that kind of practice for a long time, but it certainly has its own characteristics. Um, so I find myself very um, happy that I arrived in this place already fully formed because I think it would be very hard to survive Australian racism if you arrived here and still needed to be nurtured and feel like, you know, am I beautiful? Am I whole, you know, any sense of affirmation, I think, for a Black person in Australia is very, very difficult to get. Of course, um, there's lots of really interesting conversations that I, I think are happening, particularly between and amongst um, people of color, which is a phrase I hate, but people use it here, uh, <laughs> as if white is not a color, but okay, um, you know, people of color, um, 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 indigenous people, uh, and black and brown people, those conversations to me on social media um, are very, very interesting. I'm, ha I'm lucky that I have found a place and space to work um, where there's a real commitment to working um, with black and brown people. And so that's predominantly the kind of people I find myself around on a daily basis. Um, but it's not an easy place to live when it comes to race and racism. Uh, very, very um, strong sense of entitlement to feel 
um, that white people are superior um, and a pre pretense of naivete. Often people, you know, that pretending to be innocent is so strong um, in this place. And that's because I think sheer numbers, just the demography of it. Yeah. Yes, I can totally relate to everything you said. And I thought I came in with my eyes wide open from my history and learning about the country, but some stuff really still gets under my skin. So it's, yeah, it's a very, you know, evolutionary process um, being That's here. Right. But I appreciate your comment. Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Oh, sorry, I was muted. I said, who's, who's going to go next? <laughs> I, I, I will go because I was just right before you came on. I don't know if you heard we were talking about the relationship in the book uh, between parents and um, identity a little bit. And I kind of um, was wondering about there's, there's such a strong sense of a South African identity, but not necessarily for Swaziland, as it was called at that time of the book writing, that not a sense of being sort of a binational person. Yes. So I just wondered about that. And I also wonder what you're working on now. I would love to know too. Thank you. Okay. So yes, absolutely. South Africa was the story of our lives um, uh, because of its particular unique political history and all of that stuff. And of course, because the person in our family who was the South African was my father, right? So it's very much the, the, the male story is the story, you know? Um, so that's definitely, I think, a function of it. And of course, because my father was the freedom fighter, like all of that kind of stuff follows. Um, and my mother very much g gave her life to... Um, the South African struggle and to loving her husband. So mm -hmm. I think that story became our story and very much overshadowed Swaziland, which is sort of like having, you know, your father be from New York and your mother be from Ohio. Like New York yeah. is going to be a sexy place. Sorry to offend any, <laughs> any Ohioans, <laughs> but New York is going to be the sexy place, right? The thing that, um, that you long for, that you talk about, that, Etc. So that was very much, uh, I think, just part of the story, how we grew up. Um, and Swaziland is a beautiful, tiny, peaceful kingdom uh, with some of its own internal problems uh, of a monarch who, you know, is deeply misogynistic and, you know, has lots and lots of its own issues, but very much South Africa is my story. Um, in terms of what I'm working on now, in these COVID days, honestly, I can barely concentrate. I <laughs> was due to go to a residency in Northern Italy, which clearly is wow. not going to happen. Yes, <laughs> for a month. <laughs> so clearly that's not going to happen. And I was really looking forward to that fellowship, that residency, so that I could um, focus on what the next book is going to be. I have a few ideas and I. I'm kind of playing with fiction. Um, I think the the memoir was a first stretch uh, stretch of my legs and sort of trying to exercise the writing muscle. Mm. Um, and the 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 resurrection of Winnie Mandela was sort of straight biography. Right. Um, but I think the next one um, might be fiction. Wow! Oh. <laughs> <Exciting. laughs> <Exciting. laughs> cool. Who else has something I'd like to ask? I can go. All right. um, hi, I just want to um, first say how much I loved your book. It was so beautiful. Thank so you. I loved reading every part of it. Um, and one of the things that I found really striking was um, the way that you talked about how you transitioned the way you thought about your parents um, and how that changed from when you were a child to when you were an adult and how you saw them in a new way. And it felt to me like it was a parallel to how you transitioned to thinking about South Africa. 
um, and how you looked at that as an adult rather than somebody in exile and, and even with more of a child's view of it. Um, so mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about um, that and, um, and just about that, the relationships with your parents, which I thought were so interesting and so well written and well expressed. Thank you um, for that. Uh, the great thing about writing a book is that pe people um, uh, make you realize and see things that you hadn't fully seen before. So I have to say that that connection, the parallel between my uh, growing understanding of my parents um, and both their relationship, but what they each meant to me vis-a-vis -vis, um, my growing understanding and knowledge of the country. I hadn't actually ch mapped that um, parallels as clearly as you've just defined it. Um, so thank you <laughs> for an insight I had not yet made myself. Um, you know, definitely, I think part of growing up is being able to understand your parents in sort of fuller uh, detail. And, uh, you know, as I said before, the story of our lives had always been the story of my father. Everything we did everywhere we were was in service of, you know, um, South Africa's liberation. Uh, and so my mom was there, but she wasn't really there. I mean, and in some ways, I think some of the secret of good parenting is to make your kids not feel as though you're fully really there, that, you know, things are getting done without kids having to think about how they get done. Mm -hmm. I think about this a lot um, as a parent, that balance between doing that and also making them realize that you are making sacrifices and that things don't just do themselves. Um, and maybe my mother <laughs> erred a little bit more on the side of just making sure that things got done um, because of the diff you know uh, circumstances in which we're living. Um, so yeah, part of you know by the time I wrote the book, so much had happened, and I really used it as an opportunity to reflect on my mother and her life and who she had fully been. Um, and so I was grateful that I was working on the book at the same time as various other things were unfolding. Um, I was grateful for the opportunity to really think about who she was and what she had meant um, to our family, how she had held us together and how our family story had always been her story. We just didn't, you know, know it yet. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Hello, I guess I'll go next. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm calling in from New York and I shared with the group that, you know, I came across your book while I was traveling. I was interning in South Africa, Slum Dwellers International. And every mm. time I travel, I usually try to get a book by an author from that country. And, you know, so I'm of West African descent. So um, I was so happy when uh, the book owner, um, the bookstore owner recommended your book and I, I loved it. And one of the things, um, especially working with, SDI, I was curious to, you know, not just the history of South Africa, but like the dream of South Africa um, mm -hmm. from the revolutionary point of view and what it is now, right? And also like people who have lived both of that, like been in between. And I think you were, you, you talked about that. But I'd love to hear more about that as well as like now you're a mother, right? And how do you, what, what dreams about South Africa are you instilling in them, you know, and how are they viewing South Africa now? Mm. Great question, thank you. Um, so, I mean, the dream of South Africa remains the thing that um, is like my moral compass. Like, um, it's the one thing that no matter what happens in reality to South Africa, the dream of South Africa is the one thing that will perpetually guide my life. I know it sounds kind of crazy, uh, and maybe vaguely cultish, but because of how I grew up, <laughs> because of how I grew up, the idea that there was this place that existed in the world that so many people believed could one day be free, that you know millions of people marched to free Nelson Mandela and Tracy Chapman sang, you know, in a concert about uh, him, that um, you know people forced companies to divest. Uh, from, you know, South Africa, like so many people's legs moved, feet moved, you know, in service of this idea was not 
about South Africans, not that we were such a special people. It was about the idea that racism could be defeated. And so for me, the dream of South Africa is very much still alive, even though, of course, we have seen that people are incredibly poor, that the government of liberators has let us down as it has in so many other places, including at this stage in the world America, including the UK, like the, the distance between who leaders are and what we expect of them and what they actually give us is, is the part of the reality of being human. And so the dream I think uh, remains incredibly important to hold on to that ideal, if only as a mechanism to measure people against their failures, a mechanism to hold people accountable. So I think letting go of the dream is a really bad idea, even as we know that having sort of, you know, hope for no reason is, um, is not helpful either, right? So it's about, for me, the dream of South Africa is about injustice and racism and holding on to the idea that we ought to expect and demand better no matter where we live uh, and then measure people against how close they are getting to that dream and then kick them out when they're not doing it. Uh, and that's the part that South Africa has not managed to do yet. We have not managed to kick out the people who liberated us. I remain hopeful, but realistic about the prospects of doing that in the absence of good alternatives. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And then any points about your children and how they're the kids. Being <laughs> the kids. <laughs> so yeah. we're in lockdown, so they are not my favorite people right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um it, parenting is hard it's joyous and wonderful but it's very very hard um because there are so many things about how you grew up that you assume will just transfer I immediately <laughs> and then again you realize wow these people were working hard <laughs> to shape me in this particular direction <laughs> um they are, um, and so I, I reflect all the time on how you help to mold a human, realizing that actually the human wants to be who the human wants to be, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of my parenting style is um, really asking questions and listening to the kids and then figuring out, um, so we constantly have these uh, conversations and w about racism and sexism uh, and the kids, w which the kids lead because, you know, we'll be sitting in the car and my son will be like, well, that's racist. And I'm like, actually, no, that's not racist. That's just a description. Right. And then he'll be like, oh, okay. And then he'll be like, well, that's not racist. I'm like, well, actually, yeah, that kind of is racist because it's a stereotype. Right. So, so I think <laughs> having, um, conversations and letting them lead those conversations and listening, uh, and being surprised and in awe of you know what they can do but also um being able to to correct and guide like this is the stuff that parenting is about and um i definitely don't have the magic <laughs> thank you for that that's great <laughs> i have a follow-up question about that do do your kids think of themselves as south african they do which is very funny because my son was three when we moved here and my daughter was six now they are um, nine and almost 12. And when people ask them where they're from, they say they're South African. I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, I think they love their mom and that story has been such an important story to me. I think another part of it is that their South Africa for them is exactly what it was for me in that it is the place they are not. And so it has grown in stature as this magical place where everybody that they love lives. Mm -hmm. So they, of course, have my sisters, their auntie, like every, you know, my dad, like every big role model in their lives, everyone who they really, who loves them completely unconditionally is there. And of course, the um, South African family is so much bigger and has so much flavor. <laughs> and the, <laughs> Australian side is much smaller <laughs> um, and quieter. And so, you know, everything in, everything in South Africa becomes idealized. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing I was struck by in this book was speaking about um, domestic workers. And um, I'm really, you know, I was struck by that, that, I'm just thinking about it in terms of 
uh, at least a black and feminist kind of perspective, I uh, realize I'm, I'm about 10 years older than you and my children are also just about 10 years older than yours. So mm -hmm. it may seem challenging now and it could get <laughs> even more challenging. Um, but uh, I, I, at the time I grew up in the United States, we didn't have, we lot, we, we've been disconnected with mm -hmm. the uh, domestic worker for, for such a large portion of the population. But the kind of um, inequities and things remain, but <laughs> without that type of employment. But I had been some time in Brazil for a little bit when I during college years where that struck me that even, you know, kind of lower, I, I lived with a lower middle class family, not a wealthy family, and they had a domestic worker. And it just, it was very eye opening. Um, but I just wondered what you have to say about that in terms of sort of a, it's like a global phenomenon that, you know, that it's the intersection of uh, feminism and racism mm. and class right in the homes. And it, it's very interesting. And it was, I paid a lot of attention to that in your book. And I thank you for, you really were unflinching kind of look or it seemed that way more than many people. So thank you. Well, thanks for that. I, I want it w again, if, if you think about my primary audience as a South African one, it was very much that was a conversation for people who, uh, um, how do I say this? It is easy to wield identity as a, as a factor of disadvantage right. without, um, having to take note of your own privilege. Uh, and so I think as a black South African who was living in the new South Africa and grappling with the legacy of racism and feeling it in my life on a daily basis, it was also important for me to reflect on what it also meant to have privilege and advantage because that story of being um, discriminated against as a black person wasn't the whole story. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that I think feel, fills a lot of middle-class black women with shame mm. and or we want to invisibilize it because somehow it, pulls down our own achievements, right? So if you have someone at home who's taking care of your kids and you are conquering the world, if you don't talk about the person at home who's taking care of the kids, then your conquering of the world seems all the more remarkable, <laughs> right? <laughs> how do you do it? Well, actually, <laughs> this is how it gets done, you know? So it was, it's complicated. It's complicated, but I, I think there is no good in, do, in writing a memoir if you are not going to tell the truth. Not the truth in those sort of factual little boring details, but the truth in, in the thing, in talking about the things that, that matter and are hard for us to talk about. Um, and sometimes the risk of doing that is that there is no resolution, that you don't, you raise it and then you can't do anything with it. But I think in the raising of it is an important, there's, there's something important about raising it. It allows it to be spoken and then ultimately uh, it allows it to be, to, to be dealt with. Mm. Um, and I resolved that question by, by not having domestic work in my, you know what I mean? Like that's how ultimately you resolve it, which is not the only or necessarily the best resolution. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, that was really fascinating of the book which we were talking about how we really appreciated that <laughs> that intersectionality and that complexity um, and the bravery involved in, in taking that on uh, Yelka did you want to ask a question I can't see you but I see you going in and out of muteness I just want to thank you for that I think in your book you made it larger than your story so that it give it was it's like something i'm going to be thinking about i really appreciate you doing that thank you 
I really appreciated your chapter on why you write towards the end of your book. Um, and I think what I'm curious to know is just what the process of writing this memoir looked like for you and whether or not, like how you were maybe writing and documenting these different parts of your life as you were living them. Um, I'm just curious to know more about that. Um, thank you. It was actually, I had finished the book and I didn't have that chapter in it. And it's probably the chapter that gets brought up, uh, you know, one of the most frequently brought up chapters, um, people. Um, so it's funny, I hadn't written it, I hadn't put it in there. And then um, I had a couple of readers uh, and uh, my agent actually said to me, I think you need a chapter on why you write. It's such an important part of your kind of politics and your political practice and da da da. And I was like, no, <laughs> and, she, and she was right. <laughs> um, so, uh, so how I write is essentially um, all, all the time, constantly when I'm writing a book. So n nothing else exists and, you know, everyone in the house, the kids are like, oh, mama's writing a book, mama's got a deadline, you know? <laughs> so um, it becomes all consuming. I treat writing when I am writing a book, um, which is different from when I'm writing sort of essays or short commission pieces. But when I'm writing a book, I'm fully, fully focused and I, um, try to set up my life and this is not easy but I try to set up my life so that when I'm writing a book I'm writing full-time so I treat it like a job so I uh, t the kids go off to school in the morning and I sit down and I write and I take a break for lunch and then I write and then I get the kids from school and then you know that writing is over so it's very much a full-time thing I did lots of research for the book I know that sounds silly because it was my own life but um I had many, many conversations with family members, um, uh, with my sisters, uh, with aunties to try to remember to, you know, to say, well, this is what I remember. Did this actually happen this way? And then, of course, I did lots of other research on the relationship between Russia and South Africa, stuff that had been snippets that I had remembered from being a kid, but obviously would not have had the full context. And so that's why the, um, the, both the voice of the child and the voice of the kind of reflective adult narrator are such are so in, intertwined um, because it is a memoir, but it's a researched piece of work. Um, so I, yeah, it's it's nonfiction, but it certainly has elements where, you know, I do, of course I don't remember those conversations and those crazy crazy you know ladies in Zambia, um, but I certainly. I certainly had my mother's memories of it. I certainly had, um, you know, lots of um, aunties talking about stories. There's lots of stories that get passed down that you don't really remember yourself, but have been talked about in the house so many times. So there was um, lots of that. And, that. and those, to the extent that I could, those were fact-checked through the conversations, right? With, to check with my auntie. Yeah, you guys always told this story. And then, yeah, that's exactly how it happened. You know, that kind of thing. So that's very much my process. and then. I finish a draft and then I start again. So I finish a draft and then I go back and I edit every single word, um, every chapter pretty methodically, and then I do it again. So I usually have a good five or six drafts that I've edited myself before I'm ready to let anyone see it. Mm. So sorry if that's too much detail, but that's my, my <laughs> writing process. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's, it's encouraging hearing just how much the family story has played into it, I think makes a lot of sense and it's beautifully woven in. Thank you. Yes, the oral nature is so great. Mm. Wonderful, we have a few new people who've uh, joined in, so um, you should feel free to ask a question. I have a question. Okay. Um, one of the chapters that stood out to me was um, your kind of your racial identity development in, in college because I went through like kind of a similar like transition. I'm American, but you know, I was raised in a white neighborhood, and so when I went, got to college, like the activist was born. Yeah, came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, the other part, it's just so interesting, like kind of seeing. American racism from like kind of like fresh eyes. So that was really interesting. Also, um, hearing from you that it's the, the South African audience was your primary like 
focus. It's also interesting how you described it, knowing that today as well. But I'm wondering, um, you kind of explained kind of this, um, sometimes there's a disconnect between African and African Americans. And I have felt that too in my experience. <laughs> but I'm wondering like if anybody else or like, um, has has had that experience or like if you if you have any I know you, you were very frustrated with the Africans that were not down <laughs> but I'm wondering if there's anything if you have any suggestions for something that we can do to like bridge the gap because we're all like we I feel like we have a lot more in common <laughs> than yeah than absolutely the, right <laughs> yeah and it's also the case that um and this was very much the case when I felt when I moved to America, and I don't remember if this is in the book or not, because it's been a while since I read it, um, is that I felt more at home in America than I had felt anywhere. And I felt particularly at home in America because of African Americans, because that experience was exactly my experience of being pulled away from this continent and then not being able to go back. And then, and then when you go back, realizing, actually, I'm not the same as everybody else here. So I feel like the African-American experience is one that I fundamentally connect with and relate to, even as I know that it doesn't describe my um, experience. Um, I think that since I wrote the book and even obviously definitely since I left uh, you know, the United States, there has been such this emergence of a generation of Africans who have grown up in America yeah. and who are in f so fundamentally influenced by African-American culture and are influencers in that culture as well. And so in some ways that begins to bridge that question. And then in other ways, so many of those old rifts, you know, remain this idea that like, you know, uh, well, you know what, I don't even want to say it because I feel like even saying those stereotypes is just so, like I, I just, I hate it because it's so easy to, to, to fall into stuff with that. And so the question about how we bridge the gap, I think is by insisting on forging friendships regardless. I think it's by um, being open and curious. I think it's by travel, by um, Africans continuing to travel to America. That happens out of need more than it does out of um, uh, tourism. And um, because so many Africans don't have enough money to travel to the United States as tourists, but I love the notion of Africans touring America um, because for so long the equation goes the other way. Yeah. Um, and, it, and of course it comes from African Americans being, uh, continuing to be, I think there's a long history of African Americans seeing Africa as a mother continent, as a source of culture, as a source of all of this stuff. And I think continuing that is fantastic. But I think Africans demonstrating that same humility and generosity the other direction and continuing to see Amer African Americans are such a source of insp inspiration for people around the world in terms of how you have survived, triumphed, the innovation of that culture, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that mutual respect stuff is super important and it's never been more important, um, particularly given what the world is going through now with a Trump presidency with a Boris Johnson presidency, like people, black people living in the African diaspora are not in a good situation. And if there were ever a time for unity, I think it's now. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I did wanna just let you know that it's 6.30, so I don't want you to, this is this is the time we agreed upon. We're happy to have you as yes. long as you want. But <laughs> so no problem. Back to let you know that. Um, we can we can certainly keep it going for a bit longer. No okay. problem. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else has some questions? Can I ask another question? This is Yelka. Yelka. Um, sorry. This is Yelka. Yeah. Um, I in the book you you talk about your your relationship, your your husband, and how you guys got together, and your reservations about being in a relationship with him, him being a, a white man, and you having an identity as you know as a, you know, as a freedom fighter and what, you know, what white means and what that means for your identity as a black woman, if you were to date a black man. And, um, and it's interesting because when I read the book, I had just broken up with my ex-boyfriend at the time and he was Caucasian and my father was very adamant. My father is 
kind of like he's West African and um, mm-hmm. but very radical in his thinking about identity, about race, and um, and was not very supportive, you know, about mm-hmm. that. And I yeah. think reading your book, I think I I kind of revisited all those emotions I was experiencing, but not mm-hmm. within myself, but what you were feeling, but through my dad, like, but my dad right. was, he was expressing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you, I think, like, in retrospect, because you talked a little bit bit about how your parents reacted but do you Mm. think like and they seem to be very receptive to it right um yeah have you had deeper conversations with them since um because you didn't go too much into it but if you have any yeah he look my parents uh were very much of the school of thought that um the the what, uh, we are one people. The f- struggle against apartheid was a struggle for dignity and for respect. Um, is, they were certainly not in any way of the black consciousness um, mm. variety, and that was very much where I was he- heading in my college yeah. days. So it was it was they it was never an issue for them. It was always my issue, never their issue. Um, yeah. And o- and over time, it certainly um, has not stopped being an issue in our relationship. I, w- last night we had a big argument because um, Simon put on the uh, Blues Brothers for the kids. He was like, there's certain movies that everybody has to watch. And I was like, this movie has not held up well historically. It is just, you know, this is just cultural appropriation. Like I was all, you know, <laughs> I boycotted watching the movie. <laughs> It was just like, it was a mess, but it was great because once again, these are the conversations that are constantly happening in our household, right? So there's no like, I don't feel the need to then say like, turn off the TV. This is not, the kids watch, the kids listen to us debate it in Mm. heated terms. And then the kids make up their mind about which, you know, way they're going to fall. I always tease, you know, we we have this joke in the house that we've got one black kid and one white kid because my son... (laughs) my son can dance he does not really like water in terms of like jumping in the ocean my daughter is adventurous she loves you know surfing and uh, (laughs) so you know that's (laughs) so no it was always my issue it was never my parents issue it is also um you know I think they're the one line that I that I I wrote which I really come back to all the time in my own mind is this sense that that if people think that race is the most interesting thing about my husband and I well that's such a shame right Mm -hmm. that that if your relationship is is defined by that then so it's a factor it's a thing that is part of both of our identities but it can never ever ever be defined by that and that people observing from the externally will always want to think that because race means so much in our society and of course I understand it but that it's like the least interesting thing about us yeah thank you (laughs) okay um i had a question for you um as a avid feminist after writing the book did anything change did you have any insight that sort of changed your thought about your ideas about um feminism no but um partly because I was already so old when I wrote this first book, you know, <laughs> you know, I see all these, um, you know, people publishing books in their, in their early twenties and I'm so jealous. Yeah. And by the time I wrote this book, I was, by the time it was published, I was 37 and I was already fully for, I was, you know, I had, I was who I was. Um, and of course, you know, we learn and, and there are things about us that grow, but it's more of a, a sort of deepening of understanding and maturity. Um, seeing things in a, in a new light, but not anything around which I've sort of fundamentally made a reversal. Um, some of the things that I learned after publishing the book were, were, were more about the, um, the publishing industry. And, uh, you know, you always tell yourself that you think that you know how it all works, but I think being a published author was a real ride in terms of representation, the photographs they want to use of you, the way they want to sell your narrative like all of that stuff in terms of pushing back as a woman about representation in terms of pushing back as a black woman 
important about how your story is packaged and sold like that that was a real ride and a lesson um mm -hmm. but that's a you know that's a different story for another day <laughs> <laughs> Um, sort of sort of a backup. Another thought around that is after reading your book, I actually went and asked my mom because I I'd never asked her the question of, hey, if you wasn't if you you know wasn't focused on being a mom and a wife, what did you want to do? And she was like a journalist, <laughs> and I was like, what? I mean, and I'm close to my mom, but I never asked the question. And it's kind of like as daughters, sometimes you don't see your mom past being a mom. That's right. And yeah. So thank you for that. Oh, well, I'm so glad to hear that you asked that question. You know, so often with the people that we love the most, there are certain conversations that you just don't have because you don't even think of them. You don't think to be curious about each other. And I think that, yeah, for me, curiosity is just the biggest biggest, biggest, most important trait in life. I'm constantly trying to push my kids to be curious. Mm -hmm. I think it's so wonderful that we can have this uh, celebrate your book with you, with people all over. I'm just so delighted. And, and at this time where we are all connected in a, in a more difficult way, we're all literally connected on two planes at once at this time is something I'm not going to forget. And I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I, and I appreciate that, um, that reflection on this particular moment that we are all experiencing. It is one of the few times as the, I have never been in a time when I can literally associate myself with everybody in the world. We are all going through this together and that right. is tough, but I think it's, uh, if we come out of this on the other side and we've all flattened the curve, no matter where we live, I think that um, this will be something to hold on to. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you thank so you. much. What yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Such yeah, a my pleasure. pleasure. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Fascinating person. <laughs> we look forward to your next book. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Oh, it's getting kind of weird. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Be well. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Um, so that was amazing. Thank you, Faith, for organizing the having her come on. My so pleasure. incredible. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Faith. My pleasure. Excellent. Yeah. No. <laughs> it was so funny when this when you first reached out and you're like, "Oh, are we going to have to cancel?" And I'm like, "No, we can make it better." <laughs> all right. no, that it does make it better and it was before everybody was doing all this zoom stuff i was just like what you know what can we do what can we do what can we do and then that became the norm and for yeah. introverts like me it's just <laughs> better than normal life <laughs> with a limited access to cocktails i am missing there you my go. cocktail crew so. <laughs> so what's our book for next month okay um i'm glad you asked that because yeah. we do have we have online um, a book listed that's called Small Country, but we're not going to use that book. And um, it's be because it's very hard to get um, a hold of, and we don't want there to be any accessibility issues for anyone. Um, I'm assuming that we're going to be in the same um, position on April 26th, um, which is the last Sunday of the month and the next scheduled meeting. So um, we are switching it up and we are going to read Lagoon by Aneti Okorafor. Is that how you say her name? Okorafor, yeah. Okorafor. Um, and uh, it's a little dip into Afrofuturism. Um, and I think it's, I haven't read it, so I'm looking forward to reading it. It's an author that I've um, been interested in for a long time, so I welcome the opportunity um and 
it will be up on our website soon, like within the next couple of days, and we'll have a new Zoom link for everyone. Right. Okay. So you've, um, will you have hard copies, or should people just get it on their own? We I yeah we don't, we won't be able to get copies of it in the um, bookstore, and also it just the lo logistics of getting in the building and sending them is really challenging right now. So. Um, I will encourage, I'll, I'll put up a link um, of where to buy it, um, so maybe a couple different choices. And of course, I will encourage all of you to support your local bookstores. Um, right. And yeah, if you um, can support your local bookstore, otherwise it is, there's a very good, re I, just, I just listened to the audio, ver the audible version. It's very nicely done by that Ghanaian woman who, who narrates so many of them. Um, and then there, you can also get it on ebook. Um, so there should be safe, effective, economical ways of getting it. And we thought because it's got a, you know, it's got some futuristic, it's not like terrifying dystopian, but it is just futurist enough to kind of like relate to what's going on. So it's humorous and it's basically meteors land, aliens land in Lagos. And it, and there's an African rapper. <laughs> And to a, well, there's like a nurse, a rapper, and somebody else who needs a day. So, can you can you get Nettie a core right. to join us? Wouldn't that be cool? I will ask. I know her, and I've known her for a long time, so I'll ask and see. I would love it. I love. Yeah, it. Yeah, that would be great. I'll ask her. And, yeah. you know, and you may know that um, what's his name? Uh, what's the thing that's out of Croatia? Um, what was that HBO series? like everybody's being killed all the time it's filmed in croatia game of thrones so that's yeah. that's <laughs> like, <laughs> like what oh, that old show <laughs> so her next one so her series is supposed to be the next game of thrones so that guy whatever his name is uh, is the executive producer on the hbo series they're developing out of her uh collection she who fears death but that's super dark so i didn't want us to read that but oh. she's going to be a household name if she's, I mean, she is for many of us, um, but she's going to be like Game of Thrones household. So now would be the moment to get her to, to dial in if I can, you okay. know, but she has a lot of, I mean, she gets a lot of, I mean, she's big already. I think she's the first black woman to win a Hugo, a Hugo and the Nebula. So she's really a pioneer in the Afrofuturism world. So it should be fun. Yeah, cool. great choice. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for coming together today. Um, it was really, like I said, super special um, experience for me and I hope for all of you. And um, it's just so nice to see all of your faces and connect um, during this time. And um, if you are able to help support MOAD, of course we would appreciate it, but I know everybody is having a, a hard time right now. so. Take care of yourselves, be safe and be healthy, and we'll see you next time.